The story of Jesus that we just heard has something to say to us about three, I would say, core issues surrounding our faith and the setting in which we find our lives in. Yes, it is the setting, the times in which we live. There's a word for that. But also it details, I believe, the whole issue on what is the mission of the church. We, we have a mission. We have a covenant. But let's hear what Jesus has to say very simply and succinctly about our mission as a people of God. And then Jesus also touches on the power of passionate, persistent praying. So I'd like for us to put our imagination hat on for a moment and get into the setting that Jesus wanted his hearers to be in when he laid out this teaching. And it is a scenario of what life is like at the midnight hour. Midnight, think about that. What is midnight like to you? When you you think of it, what things come through your mind? I, I think of a number of things. First of all, it's hard to make sharp distinctions when it's midnight. You may have noticed in the lower parking area, there was two cones by the lawn just before the door. The reason that was there is there's an indentation in the ground, and I was walking at midnight one night, and I fell down. It was midnight, so we have some cones there. It's dark, and colors, they don't stand out when it's midnight. It's like driving your car in a fog. And when you're driving in the fog, outlines are blurred. It's blurry living, a blurry environment. And a path or a roadway, it's difficult to follow a path when it's midnight. And... You could succinctly say, it isn't easy to make sharp distinctions when it's midnight. And in the midst of that, I would add that our inability or unwillingness to make sharp distinctions And when we are unwilling to do that, everything becomes relative. Whatever is, is okay. For this kind of midnight living has also been referred to as the cultural, religious, and moral situation in which we find ourselves in right now in our society. And I would submit, and it was originally penned by Carl Jung, that the central neurosis of our time is emptiness. Emptiness. Yeah, I get up, go to work. Go to the ball game. There's this emptiness. There's something, that, there's this neurosis of an emptiness. And, and then when you think of what am I here for? What is life all about? Who knows what life is all about? If indeed living is about anything. There is a midnight, a midnight of difficulty in discovering where the lines are to be drawn. It's like driving in the fog and trying to keep the car on line. Or driving on Capitol Drive with all those cones all over the place. It's easy when it's midnight to be preoccupied simply 
with things to be avoided, a barrier in your path, a stone in your way, and you don't see it. It could be a prowling animal. We've got coyotes here. <laughs> it could be a purse snatcher or worse, behind the hedgerow, and you live in fear. You've been living in fear in the times we are in? Midnight can be a time of fear. And so here we are, quite consequentially, quite naturally, the tendency is to be engrossed. To be engrossed in things to be avoided, of which to be afraid, and from which, if possible, to escape. And I suggest to you that that says something about the time that we are living in, not just in Jesus' day, we're living in those times now. For midnight is a time to believe that nothing that really matters could really happen. We're sunk. How can anything worthwhile be done at midnight? Okay, note that. I wanted to paint that picture. Because that's what Jesus said. Get into that mode. It's midnight. We're in this thing together. And then Jesus, he asks them a question. Here's the question. Suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight. So in that setting, he's saying, listen to this parable. And then he shares the story. I want us to look at the man who went at midnight. There's the hungry traveler. We don't know who he is. He's just hungry. He's a traveler. He's lost. He's clueless. He's lost and he's clueless. He's lost his way and he finds a house and he knocks on the door. And uh, he's hungry. It's midnight, a knock on the door. He's thirsty and confused. And so the person who answers the door, wanting to help him, remembers, oh, I forgot to go to pick and save today. And there's nothing in the pantry. But I'm going to go to my neighbor's house. My next door neighbor, they stockpile stuff. They go to Costco. They get big, big groups of things. So he goes to his neighbor's house. He knocks at his neighbor's door. A lot of knocking. I wonder if, if um, Bob Dylan was thinking, knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. There's a lot of knocking here. Um, and when he knocks on the neighbor's door, it's interesting. There is, um, it's deep sleep. It's midnight sleep. And the neighbor answers the door. Yeah, what is it? What do you need? Oh, I need some bread. Can you loan me three loaves of bread? Can you imagine someone knocking at your door at midnight saying, you got some bread? You would say, you're crazy. You've been, what have you been smoking? What have you been drinking? No, I can't wait till tomorrow. I need this now. So then what does Jesus do? I love it. Jesus kind of puts a sucker punch in here. Jesus story reveals something very insightful, and that is it's not because of being a friend that the neighbor gets what he wants. It wasn't because of their relationship. I mean, you know, you're going to forget your friends if someone's extremely insightful. It wasn't because he was a neighbor, and they were friends. They knew each other, but then Jesus says, but because of the boldness the boldness. Literally, the word is shameless audacity. You would be so shameless and be all, the audacity to come and knock and try to get something for someone who's hungry to wake me up in my somber? 
and you refuse to stop knocking. So the man fed and became like a midnight mediator to the visitor. He's an intermediator. That's what Jesus said. Uh, between a hungry person here and a house where he knew there was bread. Hunger supply. Hunger supply. And my dear friends, that very simply is what the role of the church is, period. And that's the role of every individual Christian, essentially, to be a midnight mediator. Christ is the source. There's a world that is hungry, it's midnight, it's all relative, whatever, it's blurry. And here you are, here we are, to be a midnight mediator. That's the metaphor, Jesus is saying, that we are to be about. You and you and I, between those who are hungry, For the bread of life and the house of bread that Jesus in the Bible prescribed, that it was Jesus Christ himself who said, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. To be a mediator between the hungry on one hand and the source of the supply, which is Jesus Christ. Now, there's hungry people all around us. It's not just hungry people who have lost their way. But I have to believe that there's a lot of hungry kids in our community who are not in a church yet. And I believe there's a lot of hungry youth who are not in a church yet. And I believe that if we keep knocking enough and going after enough and doing everything we can, we will find that there will be a segment of persons who who are hungry for the good news of the gospel. Maybe they don't know it's Christ yet, but there's a hunger. There is a hunger that is there that this would be a place that has the gospel as as we live it out that would minister to a need, which is why we persistently, and more on persistence later, are doing all we can to reach out, to learn, but to keep on asking. Now, (laughs) it's interesting. I have read this passage Many times, because as I said, the opinion of your pastor is what the church is about. It's a model of what we are to do. Now, there's a lot of other things, obviously, and we'll be going through those in September. But from a broad stroke, that's what we are about. I have actually preached this text in the last 23 years that I've been the pastor here, Three times, three times. But it, working on it this time around, two words just forcefully grabbed my attention as never before. And the two words, again, they are this shameless audacity. How dare you knock on my door to help you help someone who's hurting. How dare you ask me to support your building? How dare you ask me to mow your lawn? (laughs) The church's lawn. You you got it. There, There is this sense of craziness in the gospel, in living it out, that is so beautiful. Because we need to shake and rattle the cage up a bit. 
the shameless audacity. You know, and here's how, how Jesus clearly expressed it. He said, I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him the bread because he is his friend, yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he asks. Oh, my. So the question is, how shameless are you? That's really what Jesus is asking. You want to be a member of the church? You want to own the covenant? Well, you can say all those words in the covenant, but the issue really is how shameless are you going to be? That is the powerful word. Because it is saying that God honors a bold faith that believes what is being asked for is as good as done. So I would encourage you in your journal or as you, as you, as you identify those, those things, how, how you describe your faith words to enter the words shameless audacity. How shameless are you in doing what God commissioned us to be about? You know, if a person is shameless, they're not worried about how they will look or what other people will think. If they're audacious, they're going to be doing something boldly with the expectation of getting the results they anticipate and they live out loud with unembarrassed boldness. That's why we continued to build the building and we didn't quit. Boldness, how shameless. It's why we keep reaching out in this community because I believe there's young persons, as well as adults, of course, but we're here, we, need to, we, we, want to, we are here because the, the faith is always one generation away from extinction. And, and what, is, what is God's plan for these resources for a young person's development and their faith and how they will be equipped as they are schooled here in reaching out and caring for others. So that's why we keep on and on and on. And I've been so amazed of the, the task force that's been working on the Jesus and Me program. You have no idea the hours that they have spent developing a program, creating something they, 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 they believe would, would work in our community, that we can offer some other alternative, not just a typical VBS like every other church has, which is fine, but there's a lot of options. There's a group of people that have not responded to the invitation yet, and so we're learning, we're growing, we're reaching out, and we do that not only with kids, but also with adults. How does this church, how, what can we do for adults who are, who are not retired yet and those who are retired yet, how can we provide a place that allows them to serve Christ and grow more and more and more? And more details on that, but I think you get the idea. Uh, there is power in persistency of our prayers. And it is in this context of boldness that Jesus talked about and in detail Actually, a message we looked at two weeks ago in the power of persistent prayer. There is potency in that. In fact, Jesus concluded his message on what the church was about with the promise we heard a few weeks ago. Where he said, so I say to you, ask and you'll be given. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds the one who knocks, the door will be open. I want to encourage you to think of yourself as a midnight mediator. What kind of audacious things have you pursued? Not audacious to be obnoxious. Being audacious is not being obnoxious. Being obnoxious just, just because people have been obnoxious, it has hurt the Christian faith. There's a lot of obnoxious Christianity going on out there, and it's hurting the faith. But how can you differentiate between being obnoxious and being audacious? 
to where you'll take the risk of reaching out and offer a good news for Christ. To be a mediator between the hungry and the source of supply, which is Jesus Christ. May we be midnight mediators as the body of Christ. Would you please stand and let us pray. Lord, each one of us are here because someone reached out. Someone cared enough, either as we were children, saying, get out of bed, we're going to church. Or a neighbor went to another neighbor and said, I, I see you're hurting. I want to I wanna reach out. There's a God who loves you. There's something in this emptiness that could be satisfied. Lord, we are all here because someone did that for us. And so as we move on as a church that seeks to be focused by your, your teaching, your direction, may we think of this story of this outrageous, shameless audacity to be a witness for the faith and to provide food for the hungry, hungry spiritually and hungry physically. In the name of Christ, we would.